it going, everybody? This is Ron Sparkman for Explore Mars, and today we're speaking with Joe Cassidy, who sits on the board of directors for Explore Mars. And uh, Joe, we're just going to go ahead and dive right in. You work as the executive director of space for Aerojet Rocketdyne. Can you share some of the work that your company is currently working on to get humans to Mars? One of the big things we're working on right now is um, we're integrating the main propulsion for the SLS rocket um, down at Michoud, which is the big assembly facility down near New Orleans. And we just got the second of the engines put on for that core stage. So we're putting four engines on the core stage and it's really exciting right now because we're watching them go on. And these are, uh, these are space shuttle main engines that we've taken and updated with a new controller. And we're actually going to be updating them more in the future with uh, a lot of 3D printed parts and things like that to cut the time and, and cost of the engines down. But these are the space shuttle veterans that we're using for these first missions. And it's just so exciting to see these engines that have flown, you know, some of them have flown up to like four or five uh, space shuttle missions, and they're gonna actually be used to lift that whole new rocket up into space. And, you know, it's kind of like our main lift platform for going to Mars. So it's exciting to see it coming together now, and the real hardware. And uh, so we're working on that. Um, we also do the upper stage engines uh, down in our Florida facility. That's the RL-10 engine. Um, that's going to go for the first couple of missions. There'll be a single RL-10 on what they call the interim cryogenic propulsion system, I think, or ICPS. Um, and so that'll just basically be used to get uh, Orion and the crew all the way out around the moon, come back home. Um, but for future missions where we want to lift more cargo and even heavier payloads out to the moon, we're going to have an upper stage. It's called the exploration upper stage which will have four of those RL-10s on it. So, you know, those two things together are kind of our main lift platform for the exploration. And then the other thing that I've been working on for quite a while, in fact, most of my career is actually more related to how we're gonna transfer things around in space and that's the solar electric propulsion. So right now we're doing a big program for NASA where we're um, actually developing the next generation of higher power Hall thrusters, which are basically, you know, people use different terms, electric propulsion, ion propulsion. Um, really what they are talking about is not using chemicals and combining chemicals together and combusting them to get the thrust, but rather uh, ionizing a gas, in this case xenon, and expelling it out the back in a really high velocity so we get super high ISP. And that, what that translates into for, you know, just anybody out there is it's really good gas mileage. And if we want to go all the way out to Mars with 20 metric tons of payload, that's the way to do it. It's just like, uh, I always like to use the analogy, it's just like we do the container ships here on Earth. You know, we can load them up with, with you know, literally tons and tons of those containers and they take the, you know, long way around. It takes them a while to get from China to like the ports in the US but it's the most efficient, most cost-effective way to do it. So that's what we're looking at with the solar electric propulsion is that's gonna be kind of the logistics backbone out there as we go deeper and deeper into space. So those are a few of the things we're working on. And as a member of the board of directors for Explore Mars, what does the organization as a whole mean to you? That's a great question. Um, I, I've been around with them, not since the very beginning. I wasn't one of the founders, but they reached out to me pretty early on um, and so I've had a chance to work with Chris and, and uh, you know, many of the other board members over the years, plus almost 10 years, I guess now, if I think about it. And what I've seen, the thing I like the most about Explore Mars is it's an organization that doesn't go and try to divide people. It tries to bring people together. And we've always had the goal of getting humans to Mars but we've reached out to people like the this ISS community, the people that were doing research on the ISS. And um, yeah, I'll just tell a quick story if it's okay. You know, back in the early days of the organization, there were some people that were Mars advocates who were saying, you know, we should just deorbit the ISS. We should, we should bring that thing down. We're wasting money. Just, you know, it's a lot of money every year to keep that thing up there. Let's get rid of it and focus everything on going to Mars. And we said, you know, I guess I will take a little credit for that as I got involved. I said, guys, this is a hill 
you're not, you know, that's not going to be the hill you're going to die on. You know, if you try to fight that battle politically, you're never going to win. You should go and try to reach out to that community and get them engaged. And, and so that's what we did. We ran a conference that was one of our very first things that kind of led to H2M was something called ISS and Mars. And I just remember bringing those communities together um, and how exciting that was to me to see these people who, you know, used to be uh, sort of <laughs> thinking of those other guys as enemies, all of a sudden seeing that there was potential to work together and actually accomplish some of the goals we needed to accomplish. And I think we've just built on that, you know, over the 10 years, we've, we've brought a lot of communities together like that. And now we're doing it this year with the moon, you know, so now we've got the lunar advocates and the Mars advocates coming together and we're doing these workshops with them and we're figuring out how do we go to the moon and learn when we're at the moon, what we need to learn to get ready to go to Mars. What is the ultimate goal of the Explore Mars organization? Well, it is to get humans to Mars in the uh, 2030s. <laughs> and uh, I think uh, Chris, Chris and, uh, and uh, Artemis and, and, and uh, Janet, you know, now would probably even uh, challenge me to say by 2033. Um, I sort of hedge a little on that sometimes because uh, I'd be happy if we got there in the 2030s. Um, I was talking to a colleague at NASA the other day and she and I were planning some of the stuff for the upcoming workshop and she looked at me and she said, you know, Joe, we're inside the 20 years and, and no matter what, you know, even if it's 2039 now, uh, we'll, we'll be there in 20 years and all this stuff has to get done. So now it's down to, you know, it used to be, oh, you know, we're going to do another study. Now it's down to what are we not doing this year that we really need to be doing to get you know the risk burned down, like I was talking about earlier with the engines, putting the engines on the vehicle. We got all these things that have to start happening and get into place, so we will make that deadline. But even NASA's committed to it. It's great to see. So I'm excited, and I think our our organization has helped people really hold the, that goal in mind. Let's get humanity, and let's get all you know all the things coming together that we need to put people on on Mars by the 2030s. Can you tell us about the most incredible moment that you've experienced at the Hubis to Mars Summit over the years? Okay, so that's <laughs> the most incredible moment. Okay. Um, I think there's a couple that come to mind, um, but I think one of them was last year uh, when we brought the Afghan girls robotic team to the conference. And it was just incredible to me to sit there. I was actually sitting in the front row and to watch those young girls come out and the one, the one girl who was sort of the captain of the team was speaking uh, in her native language uh, because she didn't speak enough English that she could do it. But another girl from the team who did speak the English would translate for her. And just watching them, and, and in my mind, I'm thinking about all of the things that they've had to go through to just be able to do what they're doing, you know. Uh, from that part of the world being women and not, you know, having overcome some of those cultural uh, things that in that part of the world, it's not, you know, common for girls to maybe get that kind of education, work in a STEM field uh, and, and to figure out how to get involved in this whole robotics competition and travel from where they live to come to the U.S. And then have the confidence to stand up there in front of this audience of several hundred people, you know, at this major conference, and just project, you know, what you, they're they're uh, so proud of what they're doing, and I it just it really touched me. I thought that was really really something. So it's 2045, and we've been on Mars for a decade. What does that new world look like to you? So 2045, um, I think what I believe we'll do is we'll get there. As I said, in the 2030s, uh, I think we'll we'll begin to build up capabilities. And so, over a decade, if we go every opportunity, which is another thing I think is really important. I think once we start going, we better be there every two years. You know, just like clockwork. And every time we go, we'll take some more things. We'll take some power systems. We'll take some mining systems. Um, you know, more mobility. So by the time we've reached the 10 year mark, we would have been back maybe five or six times. And we should have what's essentially kind of like an Antarctic outpost today. You know, what, what we have in Antarctica today, where 
scientists now can just go. We won't have to take all that stuff uh, each time. So we can focus more on what are the essential things that we'd like to do to uh, give the scientists a better opportunity to learn more about Mars, hopefully find some life there, you know, whether it's uh, fossil, yeah, fossil evidence of life or extant life, however we do it. But I just am excited that, you know, we're gonna have the chance to build that capability up over time and actually have a place that we can send people to, essentially like we do now with the NSF going down, you know, to the, to the campaigns that they do in Antarctica. Each year, young minds like those from the Weiss uh, School and the Epping Girls Robotics team come to the event. What do you see in them that makes you hopeful for the future? Um, <laughs> uh, what do I what do I see? They're, they're, I I am blown away every time I talk to those kids. Like I, I, I you know I certainly the Afghan girls that was very touching and just you know I I can just imagine the struggles that they've had to face. So the perseverance I think is one thing. Just seeing kids like that that have to really want that so bad you know it, it uh i think about how lucky in my life i've been to be where i was and to have the opportunities i've had and for kids like that who uh, it's not a given you know they they have had to really fight to make those things happen and then like the kids at the y school gosh you know just they they are incredible just in terms of their um the capabilities that they have now in, in that level you know middle school high school they're building satellites they're flying satellites i just i'm like wow you know that when i was growing up i was still building my little uh, revel models of the apollo and things like that blew it together you know uh so they're doing things that are so far advanced compared to what we did in our day so i feel like the future's in great hands and i'm just excited to see kids that, uh, you know, hopefully we can help them with that by doing some of the stuff we're doing to get people to Mars and inspiring them to want to continue to pursue careers in STEM fields. In the last few years, the exploration of Mars has solidified more and more into a certainty. What is Explore Mars working? And where do you want to be the very first moment that humans step on Mars? I think a couple of things. Uh, one, we're doing the, um, we've done a series of workshops we call Affording Mars, and it's actually gotten to be we still use the acronym AM, but it's now Achieving Mars, and we've actually broadened it to include the moon. So we've, we've, we've run these workshops now for, uh, this is our seventh one that we're getting ready to do in a few weeks. And what we're doing with each one of those is trying to better define some of the really tough challenges that are out there. Um, I'll give you a good example. One of them um, is entry, descent, and landing at Mars. Um, we know it's hard, uh, it's been you know, the, the bane of many a Mars mission, <laughs> and we've been fortunate in the U.S. to be able to do what we've done with Curiosity and Spirit Opportunity before that. Um, we've gotten very creative, you know, folks at JPL have come up with fantastic ways to approach it with like, uh, you know, the sky crane now. Uh, but even that, we were able to do like one metric ton. We can land a metric ton on the surface of Mars. Um, we're gonna have to scale that up by about a factor of 20. You know, we need to land about 20 metric tons to 30 metric tons on the surface to support human exploration. And we probably need to do that multiple times uh, for, for every mission. So we've got this whole campaign of flights. Um, so entry, descent, and landing for something that big requires us to really understand. Uh, one thing we know for sure is parachutes aren't gonna work. We tried some parachute stuff. It, it's just not going to scale up. So now what we're looking at is essentially things like uh, deployable uh, heat shields, aerody aerodynamic decelerators. Um, and there's a lot of concepts for those, but we're going to have to really work that over this next 15 or so years so that that technology gets proven out and, and it's ready. And maybe in the interim, one of the things we can do, because we want to also send some more ambitious robotic missions to Mars, we can actually do like a, a something that's almost as big as a human mission, but it's a robotic, you know, maybe like a sample return or something like that. We're working at different concepts right now for a Mars sample return. Um, so that's one of the ideas we have is we can do that as sort of a test mission prior to actually doing the human missions. But 
there's a number of those kinds of things and we've identified them and, and we look at them as long poles. Another one, a classic, you know, that's more of a, I'm an engineer, so I think about all the technical parts, but like for the, the scientists that are more concerned with uh, human health and the, and the docs and people like that, um, they're looking more at the long-term uh, exposure to radiation to the astronauts and uh, combined effects of radiation, microgravity. So all those kinds of things are ongoing uh, challenges that we're trying to understand better on the International Space Station. We're gonna go out and orbit the moon and the gateway. We can, we can put crews out there for longer periods of time and get some more experience with um, you know, what that environment is really going to do with the crews and um, also even just the human psychology of being out there for that long, you know, for a mission that might last as much as a thousand days. We've got to think about the psychology of being, you know, out in space. And what do you see as the biggest challenge the space Earth industry is, is right currently working to overcome like to get humans to the red planet? Okay, so, um, yeah, the, there's a couple of those. Um, one is definitely, um, you know, the whole idea that we're going to have to keep humans alive <laughs> for a thousand days in space, further in space than we've ever gone before. Um, so the, the problems associated with radiation protection, um, just with even food, you know, keeping the food um, uh, viable, uh, food and medicine, uh, both of those have issues with um, um, you know, if you're if you're gone for that long and you're in deep space, uh, potentially radiation has some effects on those things. So we're really working hard to look at that, and then also um, try to come up with things like fresh food. You know, because the one thing the astronauts on the ISS talk about is um, they really enjoy it when they get those shipments up from Earth and they can have something that's actually not freeze dried or, you know, in a tube or <laughs> some kind of a power bar. So they, uh, you know, I think all of that kind of research is going to be critical to really making it happen. And then the other side of it, I think, is um, we're working on some interesting advanced propulsion concepts where we can actually speed the mission up a little bit. So, you know, as we get um, more um, time to actually work on some of these things and we can see you know if if the possibilities are there one of the things we'll want to do is bring in some of that advanced propulsion so that we can reduce the trip times down and you know there's things like nuclear thermal propulsion we worked on it in the 60s and 70s we kind of went away from it but it actually has some potential and if we get out there and we're working around the moon and we've got places where we can safely test in space and you know, actually demonstrate some of these things uh, with some missions in, in lunar orbit, um, then we can probably say, yeah, let's, let's uh, on-ramp that in and we can use that as our crew delivery system. If we leave from lunar orbit, we can take off and maybe we can cut that trip time down by two or three months. And where do you wanna be the very first moment that humans step on Mars? Oh gosh. Um, well, let's see, if it's in the 2030s, uh, I'll probably be sitting in my rocking chair on my porch somewhere. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, uh, gosh, where would I want to be? I'd actually love to tell you the truth. Well, it wouldn't be the landing. That would be the launch. I, I'd love to be at the Cape and watch them launch. That's for sure. And then uh, I think at the landing, um, it'd be super exciting to be sitting there in mission control, you know, watching that feed come down as, as those guys and gals are, are touching the surface for the first time. But I'll be happy no matter where I'm at, you know. <laughs> I just want to, I just want to live long enough to see it happen. <laughs> Explore Mars works hard to develop policy for our country's leadership. What can the average person do to motivate the people in Washington? Good question. Um, I think one of the things that um, I'm going to give a shout out to uh, Rick Zucker here. Rick's been a warrior for us in Explore Mars. And before that, he worked for some other space organizations at organizing what we call the legislative blitz every February. Um, and they, they get people from as much as we can from all over the country. You know, the one thing legislators love to have is their, for their constituents from their districts to actually call them and talk to them or email them about issues. 
And so what Rick does is he gathers up a big team of people. They go up on the hill, they walk around. We break up into teams and we go see these people in their offices or they talk to their staff. But I would just say, reach out. You know, it's really easy nowadays. Uh, go online, uh, find out who your local representative and, and the senators are. And if you care about it, if you're passionate about that happening, let them know. It never hurts to have it. And, and especially, you know, if you're from Wyoming or you're from Montana or, or uh, even Hawaii, you know, <laughs> you're from someplace that's not traditionally maybe thought of as a space place, um, your voice is as important as anyone's. And if you if you let your representative and congressmen and senators know that, that they're, that they're um, get, you know, they're going to vote. They're going to have a chance to vote, and and uh, you want them to know that it's important to you. The more of that kind of stuff we get, it's a grassroots support. And one of the things we've done polls, and we always, when we get the polls back, we always see a really high percentage of people who are in favor. And I think that just needs to be reflected in what the people in Congress are hearing too, um, because we take those polls and those results up to show them. And if they hear those people, you know, writing to them and things like that, that just backs up what we're telling them. And what's your advice for anyone that wants to be involved in getting humanity to Mars? I would say if, if that's something that's important to you, um, then there's like loads of places for people to get involved. Um, you don't have to have an engineering degree. Um, you don't have to be a scientist. Um, Find a local organization like uh, Planetarium. Um, there's there's uh, lots of astronomy organizations around the country. Get connected up with those folks. Um, join. <laughs> it's not hard to join Explore Mars. All you have to do is go online. Uh, you can you can access exploremars.org. Um, get involved. You, you can't necessarily always, if you're in another part of the country, get to the meetings like H2M. By all means, if you if you can, come to those. Um, but but you can get involved at a local level. You can get involved in, in a lot of different ways. And um, there's even things that citizen scientists can do nowadays. Uh, there's loads of data sets out there that NASA is getting from all the craft that we have, you know, on the surface of Mars and in orbit around Mars now. And that data is actually out online. So if you go to like the JPL website and look for opportunities, you could even find a thing where maybe you could you could scroll through a lot of uh, images from Mars and look for something that's important to NASA. Uh, you know, there's a lot of ways that, that people can get involved. I think people sometimes think, oh gosh, you know, I'm not a scientist, I'm not an engineer, uh, I'm not a, I'm no good at math lots of ways you can do it and and the other thing is talk to people you know i think one of the things that sometimes uh in the community we're not that good at is we don't share enough with people our passion and and if you just know people in your neighborhood and you tell them hey you know we have a, a car on mars right now and we drive it around and we take pictures and you know download a couple of those pictures and have them that you can show people it's amazing the effect that that has on people when you share your enthusiasm. And, and a lot of times I think people just don't even hear about that because it isn't something that's necessarily covered in the media every day. So, you know, being a good citizen advocate can do a lot to help the cause. Thank you, Joe, for coming on today. We appreciate your time.